to Shaping the Way We Teach English Webinar Course 14, brought to you by the American English Team. My name is Jennifer Hodgson, also known as Moderator Jenny. So welcome to teachers from all over the world. I see people from countries all over the, country, all over the world. Here you can see the Course 14 schedule, with today's webinar being the fifth webinar of Course 14. Um, so we hope you'll be able to join us for the last webinar in two weeks. And if you missed any, you can also view the webinar recordings on our name, on the American English website, and our AE YouTube channel. I think most of you know this by now, but just a few reminders. During these webinars, you will hear but not see the presenter. The way for you to participate is by using the chat box, as you are already doing. And this is where you can ask questions and make comments related to today's topic. Your presenter may also ask you questions in the form of polls. These are multiple choice questions that will appear on your screen for you to answer. You'll also see myself, moderator Jenny, and moderator Heather in the chat box to assist you. Some people may experience technical problems, and unfortunately we cannot fix individual technical issues. But we will let you know if there is a global technical issue. If you do lose sound, a great way to follow along is with the caption pod that you see at the bottom of the screen. Webinar courses consist of six webinars. During the course, they take place every other Wednesday. And as most of you know, if you participate in at least four out of six webinars, you receive an e-certificate from your regional English language officer or local U.S. Embassy. At the very end of the webinar, we will ask you to submit your attendance by typing your email address into the specific attendance box. Please don't forget to do this, and please also do not do it until we request it. Here is the name site that I hope almost all of you are familiar with. This is where you can ask the presenter additional questions after the webinar. You can also access the recording of the webinar as well as readings and resources. If you haven't visited this site before, you first need to register and your membership will be approved within approximately two days. So now on to today's webinar. Welcome to Using Comics in the EFL Classroom brought to you by the American English team. Using comics in the classroom is a terrific way to incorporate the target language in a fun, engaging way. This webinar will demonstrate the universality of comics for any language classroom, show how multi-skill comic activities can be used with students of all ages and ability levels, and you will experience several materials that you can use in your own classrooms. You will learn how to use comics as an effective, real-world, formative assessment measure and as a springboard for vocabulary and grammar acquisition. Our presenter today is James Whiting. He has over 25 years of experience in TESOL as a teacher and teacher trainer. He is an associate professor of applied linguistics and the coordinator of the graduate TESOL program and the Chair of the Department of Languages and Linguistics at Plymouth State University in Plymouth, New Hampshire. James's professional experience includes teaching EFL overseas, teaching English at the City University of New York, and teaching in graduate TESOL programs at New York University and Concordia University in Montreal. He was a Senior English Language Fellow in Russia and a Fulbright Scholar in Panama, and James received his MA in TESOL from the Teachers College, Columbia University, and his PhD in Applied Linguistics from New York University. He is the past president of Northern New England TESOL. Just a note for participants, you will need a pen or pencil and some paper during today's webinar. Please collect those items now. Welcome, James. Hi, uh, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes? I think so. Okay. Um, great. Good morning. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, greetings from New England. Uh, how many of you know where New England is? 
New England, the United States, uh, upper right hand corner of the United States. If you're looking at the map of the United States, New Hampshire. Um, and um, wonderful to uh, be working with you all this morning. I think that we'll have a lot of fun and uh, you'll find this interesting. Um, we um, saw we had a little poll question ahead of time, and um, um, the poll looked like it was uh, very heavy on the uh, on the first question. Do you like comics? Um, many uh, folks uh, uh, answered yes to that. Now, very few people answered uh, no to that. And uh, then the other question, the one below that, uh, have you used comics in your own classroom? Um, and um, that was uh, that was very evenly split, wasn't it? That was um, like a 50-50 there. It was a, almost a tie. So um, that's great. That's actually perfect. So we have uh, folks that uh, have... Uh, used comics and uh, folks who haven't and I guess uh, since we're here this morning or here today uh, we uh, will be um, getting into that space and finding out uh, how to use them in our classrooms. We're all interested in this topic and um, we can begin to utilize them and utilize um, um, think about how to use them in our own classroom. So um, a 50-50 split on that and let's um, move forward. Let's talk about how we will actually um, do that second one that have you used, how will we actually incorporate comics into our classroom. So let's take a look at uh, what we'll be looking at today, a little outline of the presentation to begin with and um, this will give us a little sense of what's to come. Um, we, um, we'll talk about why we use comics. So we'll spend a few slides, a few minutes in the beginning of the presentation talking about why we'll use comics. Uh, we'll um, talk about some classroom usages, uh, some examples, some ways that we can incorporate them. We'll look at some uh, examples and we'll actually engage with the material. So get your pens ready for that or your typing fingers ready for that. And uh, we'll look at those. We'll talk about pragmatic intelligence um, as well, because I think comics lend themselves very nicely to getting at that higher level pragmatic intelligence. Uh, pragmatics is about humor, and so clearly we're connecting with humor in, with comics. And pragmatics is um, it's also about other relationships, um, politeness and um, sarcasm. And these are all cultural embedded um, issues. We'll look at the cultural competence piece as well. I think that this is oftentimes challenging to get into, especially in uh, L2 situations, uh, in English foreign language situations. So ways for us to incorporate the target language culture and increase students' cultural intercultural competence. Um, we'll look at comics as an assessment tool. I mean, comics can be a very rich and um, terrific uh, assessment tool for folks. And um, so that, that tying in um, quick formative access assessments um, after instruction. And I think these give us a really wonderful opportunity to incorporate that. And then finally, towards the end, we'll look at some resources, some um, terrific resources um, that um, we can incorporate into our, um, our classroom, um, use to bring comics into our classroom. Okay. So that's it. Let's talk. Um, three slides here on why we use comics. Um, and the first one is affect. Comics um, are an excellent um, avenue for us to uh, lower students' effective filter. We actually talked about 30 odd years ago the idea of trying to bring students' anxiety level down, bring back, bring down their their fear factor, their um, inhibitions, if you will, and to allow students to feel more comfortable and more relaxed and happier, if you will, uh, in the classroom. Um, it increases the fun factor. That fun factor is so important in our classrooms and uh, as a way of getting at language learning with students. So it's similar in some respects to using games or music with students. Uh, it positively impacts their motivation. Students are motivated because they're having fun and they're learning and they're learning in a way that they don't even quite realize that they're learning. It's not, um, it's not so cut and dry. Um, and it allows for creativity uh, with, with language. It also allows for creativity with art. Um, some of you looked at uh, some of the resources that were on the Ming, um, the Make Believe Comics. So you don't necessarily have to be an artist uh, or have students do actual physical drawing. They can be creative in all sorts of uh, terrific ways uh, without that um, skill set. 
Um, and it brings in, as we said before, target language culture. So, um, which students are interested in. Students, um, you know, the, the culture and, and, the, and the language are very closely connected. In this case, um, we're focusing today on American culture, but we can do this with other primary uh, English-speaking countries and their cultures as well. Um, so this is a way for us to bring in the culture uh, and also uh, at the same time students are feeling good about it. They're feeling like they're having fun in their classrooms. Um, the other thing we can do with comics, uh, the other reason uh, why we would use them is language, right? We're, we're in the business of teaching language. And so therefore, we're interested in ways of getting at language uh, in our classroom. Um, this increases um, uh, students' linguistic competence on all sorts of four skills levels, uh, reading, writing, listening, and speaking, um, wonderful, and terrific ways of bringing in um, language in small chunks so that students have access into the language. They are not feeling necessarily overwhelmed by the density of the linguistic load. They are getting um, comprehensible input in this respect. They're getting uh, language that is <laughs> going to be uh, accessible to them and not particularly overwhelming for them in many respects. Um, it's going to give us grammar and vocabulary and context, which is what we're looking for, and with that visual support in many cases, with that visual uh, scaffolding into the language so that students are getting language, they're getting the visual, they're getting it within context, they're getting it embedded within a story that is both visual support, that is giving us access into the language with those paralinguistic cues, the visual cues there. It's expandable, uh, that second bullet down. We have, um, um, we have um, role plays that we could bring out of this. We have, um, um, we have writing activities that come extension. We'll talk a lot about the literacy aspect of, of comics today, but it could also be a listening speaking activity the role plays, acting out, um, having students create their own. So there's all sorts of rich, rich, um, compelling ways of bringing in language with comics in our classroom. And we'll look at some of these when we get to the examples. Pedagogy. We're all interested in being good teachers. That's why we're here. That's why we are doing this, um, this development. And so what does it mean to be a good language teacher? Um, good language teachers are looking to bring in target language uh, practice uh, on the underside so that uh, students are working not just on the language that you're teaching them, but they're working in small groups, they're negotiating meaning, they are um, listening to one another, they are speaking themselves, they are creating, they are practicing it through student-centered work, student work that they create, they feel um, is meaningful to them, um, and these kinds of things in our classroom are bringing in um, those higher level thinking skills that we've been looking for and that we want to bring in. And when we talk about uh, terms like higher level thinking skills, we're referring to um, Bloom's taxonomy and Benjamin Bloom, the educational theorist of the United States in the 1950s, um, talked about ways that we a hierarchy of learning, a hierarchy of knowledge in the classroom and application. So what the high the higher end of that pyramid, the synthesis and the analysis, and we can see examples of those with comparing uh, comics and looking at uh, potential uh, endings that might be different from what the writer drew. Um, it could be a way for us to synthesize and to uh, create our own comics. So wonderful ways, terrific ways of getting at a higher level thinking skills in the classroom, ways for us to have students negotiate meaning and work with one another. And let's take a look at some of what that might be. Okay, so we have these three ways, three reasons, if you will, for bringing in comics. And let's um, talk about some of these more particularly now. So now we'll get into some of the activities in just a few seconds. And clearly, um, when we're in classrooms teaching language, vocabulary and grammar are the building blocks. I mean, this is it. This is the, the foundational material of our house. This is where we are doing our work with students at the syntactical level, syntax, the grammar of the, la the, grammar of the language, and also uh, the vocabulary at the semantic level. So we're looking at both words and how we can put words together uh, to make meaning. And so we are looking for ways in our classrooms to do that. And um, 
comics allow us that uh, in spades. It gives us lots of opportunities to bring in colloquial language, idiomatic speech, reduced speech, slang. Uh, all of these things are promoting meaning and they are the kind of language that students are often interested in. I, I was noticing in the poll that many of us are, uh, many of you are working with teenagers. Teenagers, this is a uh, very nice way for teenagers to pick up that colloquial language, that reduced speech that they are oftentimes interested in and will find compelling. And then that, of course, increases their motivation. Um, so, um, we will um, look at a close activity in the next slide. Uh, we all know what close activities are. Um, close is when we remove a word or a phrase from, uh, from a context, from, from, from a sentence or from a paragraph, and it is a way for us to highlight or practice specific grammar and vocabulary items that we're interested in teaching. So if we're interested in teaching adjectives, for example, or to teach the verb to be, or the continuous tense, we might be removing that in our clothes and then highlighting that particular piece and having students put that in. Um, if we have students that are at a more uh, elementary level, we would be scaffolding into that, so we'd be giving them options to choose from. They wouldn't necessarily be seeing a blank by themselves, they would just be uh, looking at uh, that blank with options to to pick from. Um, for higher levels, we could remove more. We could, um, and we'll look at that next. Uh, we'll see that we can remove either words or whole sentences and uh, what that might look like for us. So um, we're going to um, be needing our pens in a second here, and um, we're going to pull up um, um, a slide in a minute, um, a little options for us to uh, do some writing and to see what this might look like in our own classrooms, how to put this into practice and to, um, to use materials with our students as I've been describing. So is everyone ready for that? Okay, good. What we're looking at here now is um, a, a comic from the United States. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. This is um, um, a cat, a cat here, and students oftentimes like, uh, like uh, animals. So this is a way for us to, um, to I'm trying to pull the pointer over to this, I can't do that. Well, I'll just tell you in the first upper left hand, um, uh, here we are, here's the pointer, okay, now I got it. Um, first upper left hand box, we have this cat. This is the, the cat here. His name is Garfield. Uh, that's his only name, as far as I know. And he walks in, and we can see what he's doing here. He's got a uh, little paws, his front paws around his body, and he's shivering, and he's got his breath showing here. And he says, oh boy, it is blank this morning. And he moves over, and he's got the little splashing. And the sipping, and the gargling, and the gulping. And then he sticks his paws in, and he feels that feels so blank. And then he gets his back paws, back legs, I guess, and in, his body in. And then his friend, his owner, his human, says to him, you really blank your coffee, don't you, Garfield? So let's take a moment, if we can right now, all of us, um, to fill in these little boxes here. Okay, so we have the boxes. See them coming up. Um, first box, second box, and the last box. <coughs> okay, so lots of options here for this. Right? We are looking at uh, people saying um, in that first box we would be looking for in all of these boxes what kinds of words are we looking for we're looking for adjectives primarily um, and um, so um, we are seeing in the first box he might be saying uh, boy it's cold out there perhaps it's cold where you are cold here where I am uh, freezing uh, chilly, um, nippy, 
perhaps, right? So we get into wonderful idiomatic uh, language, and uh, for this first one, um, Chile. And um, then we are looking down here, and many people are saying, um, it feels so nice, it feels so uh, warm, it feels so comforting, it feels so good, perhaps. It feels so um, soothing. And um, over here in the last panel on the far right, he's saying things like enjoy or like or get into, right? So this is a wonderful way for us to get into uh, idiomatic speech with students, that, uh, those um, two word verbs. So he might be saying you really get into your copy, or you really enjoy, or you really dig, or fancy, yes, somebody from Chile is saying fancy. Um, lots of uh, ways for us to have fun with this as well. We could be having students act this out. Um, we're getting uh, from this one little six panel, eight panel, sorry, uh, comic strip here. Um, uh, idiomatic speech, we're getting reduced speech, we're getting um, onomatopoeia, so those uh, the words that sound like what they are, so uh, when you make the word and uh, it sounds like the word, so splash and gargle and gulp, um, these are words that students may not know, may not have a lot of encounters with, and it gives them an opportunity to play around with the language. I can imagine a situation where you'd have students acting this out with the right kind of learner. This could be a lot of fun in the classroom. Um, it could be a springboard to other activities, uh, talking about their own morning routine, uh, their own morning drink, perhaps, their own morning activities or food. Um, and maybe um, as all of these kinds of things students could do. There could be a response from the next box from the cat itself. Um, and I think that this illustrates for us nicely some of the points that I was trying to make earlier, the idea of idiomatic language, of reduced speech, fun, of, um, of getting into um, um, culturally embedded um, activities, like this is a well-pampered cat, what does that mean? So. Um, fun. And if we had uh, students that were um, at a more elementary level, we might give them options with that first box. They could choose between endure, um, cold, freezing, hot, you know, which would be wrong, obviously. Good. Let's move on um, and take a look at um, another one, another, um, another um, opportunity for us to do something similar but slightly different. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The next slide was this. Uh, is this? Um, we could see what the answers are, what the actual, what the writer of the comic did, um, and he uses the word um, chili. So, so let me pointer over there. Pointer doesn't seem to want to move. Um, there's the pointer. So I can drag it. Well, you'll have to imagine the pointer on top of the word chili. <laughs> and uh, there it is. Okay. And. Uh, so the word that the writer of the comic, um, Jim Davis, chose here was chilly. The, write, the word that he chose here was warm, and the word here was enjoy. But the terrific thing about comics is, or about an activity like this, is that the word cold is correct here. The word nippy is correct. The word frozen, freezing. Um, are all very correct in this context. And so there isn't a right or wrong answer. Students can feel that they did it right, even if they got the word wrong. And what are they learning there? You're, you're teaching them adjectives. How many of us have taught adjectives in our classroom? Perhaps even in this week. And so you're teaching them adjectives, you're isolating vocabulary, and they're having an opportunity to um, produce their own, to, um, to feel that they've got the right answer and to um, utilize it in a context with lots of visual support. There's probably not even 15 words or 10 words in this entire thing. And it's giving students a, uh, a way into the language. Now, 
I want to draw your attention to um, this little um, uh, website right down here, um, Garfield.com. He has a daily comic strip. Every day of the week, there is a comic on this website, new one, that you can use in your classroom. You could pull it up in the classroom if you have access to the internet. You could print it out. Uh, and you can go back and you can search through and you can see many, many of these. And many of them look like this. They're full color. And um, a wonderful, um, cheap, free uh, resource that you can bring into your classroom. Let's take a look at another. Okay, so here we have a slightly different comic. Um, this is also a, uh, a US-based comic that maybe some of you have seen. It's called Calvin and Hobbes. This is, uh, this little boy here is Calvin. And um, Hobbes is his friend, and we'll see that in another comic in a few minutes. Uh, his friend is a um, stuffed tiger. This is, so another cat, um, another pet, if you will. And um, we're looking here, um, um, and um, we see that uh, he's standing um, on the side of the street with his little lunch bucket and his lunch uh, box. And he's waiting for the bus, right? This is an experience that maybe some of your students um, can relate to. Maybe they have experienced this themselves. And you can get into, with your students, lots of linguistic cues here, paralinguistic cues, the visual support. We could talk about his moods. We could talk about the change in his mood. And let's look at the dialogue. Uh, he says, uh, I don't want to catch the bus. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to be here at all. Nice, comprehensible, easy access into the language, reduced speech, but good verbs there, interesting, um, interesting vocabulary. Uh, he says in the next box, I'm sick of everyone telling me what to do all the time. I hate my life. I hate everything. I wish I blank blank. Then he thinks about this for a moment and he says, well, no, I really don't. Uh, not really. I wish everyone else blank, blank. And so this is an interesting way for us to we were teaching the wish clause. And we were trying to get at uh, the verb to be with the wish clause in English, um, which is uh, maybe a grammar feature that you have taught with your students. This is a way for us to get into this. So we're isolating a particular grammar um, piece here. And why don't we try to fill these in as well? Why don't we take out our pens or our typing fingers and choose some interesting, appropriate, correct, and I put cor correct in quotation marks, um, words to put in there. Maybe we have some uh, interesting interpretations of what might be correct. Um, and uh, let's try that right now, if we can. Thank you, Roger. Uh, and um, put them up as you type in. Um, and um, this activity, um, so you should be trying to write in uh, the two blanks there. And um, what are some possibilities? Okay. Now, let's look at the next um, box and um, see what um, some possibilities might be for this. Okay. Um, okay. Now, some of you may have had um, something slightly different in here. He's writing, uh, he's saying, if you will, um, I wish I was dead. I'm sick of everyone telling me what to do all the time. I wish I was dead. No, not really. I wish everyone else was dead. Now, English teachers that we are, we notice, probably, right away, that this is um, perhaps incorrect language. Right? And this is an interesting grammatical feature of U.S. English. Um, correct would be, of course, um, I wish I were dead. Um, I wish everyone else were dead. Um, but we could be using this as a possibility to discuss why this seven or six year old boy would be um, using was as opposed to were. And this is interesting because we are taught in our grammar books that it's uh, were, but um, the 
the reality on the ground, if you will, in, uh, in the United States and perhaps in other places, is that this is a, a language feature that's in flux. Um, it's um, widely used, um, that uh, folks would be widely using in the United States would be was. Um, not everyone is going to use this correctly. Or um, this is one of those things where the, the correctness, if you will, is in flux. It's the, the distinction between who and whom that is very much um, kind of falling by the wayside. Um, and we could use this with higher level students to discuss why that might be. And maybe there are features in their own language, their own, uh, their, their, their L1, that are similar, that are in flux, that are rules that are either hard to follow or rules that are no longer uh, observed because it's easier and um, folks are more interested in using uh, was, why that might be. Uh, or why someone like a seven-year-old boy might not have the full uh, correct grammar. Um, and so this is a, um, an interesting way for us to get at that and uh, to see um, how language changes and language is not um, set in stone, especially um, English, which has that solidity um, over its, uh, the, the change of the vocabulary and also um, perhaps certain syntactical features as well. So um, we see here uh, with him, um, we might use this as a springboard for um, writing. We could see this as an opportunity for um, students to write about um, things that um, they don't enjoy doing or do enjoy or how they feel about going to school in the morning, etc. Let's take a look at another um, possibility. This is getting uh, into more of a um, um, uh, possibility for uh, visual support with students. Um, it's a jigsaw activity. Right? So jigsaws, you know what jigsaws are. Jigsaws are um, um, literally um, uh, can be students manipulating, holding on to, so you're getting the visual support of students um, having that handheld, that manipulables, the uh, physical aspect uh, for younger learners, this can be very gratifying, perhaps for older learners as well. We could um, use this with a comic strip when we might take a comic and cut it apart and ask students to put it back into the correct order. Again, we would be looking at, um, at correct there in quotation marks because there might be multiple correct forms. There might be ways that you could reinterpret something to um, um, with the panel that may and may or may not have been first into the second position, et cetera. So um, you could use this as an opportunity for students to justify their ordering. Why would they put something where they are? This is higher level thinking skills. This is, this is um, trying to evaluate and to decide what comes first, second, and third, and why that would be. Uh, it promotes reading and vocabulary in our classroom. Obviously, it promotes sequencing. And, um, hopefully done in groups or in pairs, and this is promoting that target language, this is that pedagogical piece that we were talking about earlier, that negotiation. And um, it oftentimes can be done with um, very little language and allows students to um, find their own order. So let's take a look at one of those right now. Okay. Um, and um, this is going to give us an opportunity to pull, uh, um, pull this up and to look at uh, um, uh, the four different boxes here, and um, we're going to do a little uh, poll of um, which one uh, we think is the correct order. Um, so we have box number one uh, over here, uh, which may or may not be box number one in this strip, right? Um, we're just going to use it as box number one here, and then there's box number two here, and three and four, so read, take a moment to read for a few seconds and uh, look at these yourself. And um, imagine that you have cut these up and you have a packet of four little boxes that you have given out to a group of three or four students. And they are uh, in your class and they're going to use the target language and their own linguistic skills to put these into the correct order. And I'm asking you to look at this as well. So if you would put number three, would you do it as three, four, two, one? Let's say three, four, two, one. Or would you do one, 
three, four, and two. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can do this in your class. You would um, utilize this as a way for um, folks to read, to decide, to negotiate. Um, they could do it with each other. And um, this would be an opportunity for students to use the target language. So we're looking at the poll here. And it looks like um, many folks are um, choosing um, three, four, three, four, two, and then one. Again, not a lot of language in here, but lots of fun language, right? Um, and we could see this as reduced speech, as um, um, contractions, rather. Uh, uh, it won't bite. It's a garden tool. Um, so let's see what the answer would be, or if you will, the correct uh, form of this would be. Okay. And the next one is three, four, two, one. Again, um, it, you could justify other orderings of this. Absolutely. You could justify and you could discuss what they would be and why they would be. Um, and um, the humor in this, what makes this funny, if you will. Why is this funny? That's pragmatics. Why would something like this be funny? Um, what is, what's going on here? And uh, I want to draw your attention as well to the... Um, the website down at the bottom here, below the, um, the third panel begins. Um, you can go there and um, choose others of these comics uh, yourself and print them out and bring them into your classroom. Now, imagine that you had a slightly more advanced level of student. You could do something slightly different with this. You could take this and you could use it as um, an activity that doesn't give the students the visual right away. Uh, each student gets one of them, um, and they are going to um, look at it, but no one else is going to see it, only that student. And they're going to think about it, and they're going to then describe it to their partner. So you're taking away the visual cues, you're taking away the reading for everyone but the partner from, from the main actor. And the others have each got their own box, and so it becomes a, uh, a more difficult linguistic and cognitive activity than it would be if they were all looking at it. So it's very easy to up the, the cognitive load there, the linguistic load, by making it something that students are not seeing each other's but only looking at their own. Um, they would look at this, they would hear each other, it becomes a, uh, an activity of listening and speaking much more. And then it becomes a visual reading writing after they place them down on the table. So it's a very simple thing to do as a, uh, as a visual um, lesson as well, um, making it more difficult for students, uh, more challenging. Um, and um, so I encourage you to see that. And look at how simple that activity is and how much good language you could get out of something like that. It just requires that cutting up of the comic and bringing it in you get the tactile experience, the physical experience. It's a game. It's fun. It's challenging. And students will get into it. They will uh, see this as, um, as an interesting uh, way of uh, learning the target language. Okay. Let's take um, um, another. We, we've been talking about things at the word level primarily, at the semantic level, so we're moving one word. Removing um, um, maybe one or two words, and so that's a semantic activity. It could be a grammatical activity, but it's really at the word level. Uh, and let's take a look at it, how we might incorporate uh, at a higher level, uh, bringing it into the sentence level, and um, using this in a more challenging way with students. Um, we could uh, remove um, an entire character's um, dialogue from a panel. Uh, we could ask students to fill this in. And this could be done again in pairs. I mean, I would encourage that because I think it really lends itself for creativity. Um, it could promote, as we will see in a few minutes, uh, pragmatic intelligence with uh, appropriate responses to questions um, from readings, etc. So I would encourage you to see um, see these as uh, real possibilities for your class. Let's take a look at one right now. Okay. 
Again, we have um, the little boy, Calvin, with his uh, friend. Uh, this time, we see the, uh, the friend is the tiger, the one that he is standing next to here. This is uh, Calvin to the left, and uh, Hobbs to the right. Um, if you're looking at the screen there, and he says, if you could wish, again with wish with this, if you could wish for anything, what would it be? And the tiger sits down and he says something. Now, you could see this as a great way of bringing in writing for students at a small scale. We're not asking for a lot, but we're asking them to be creative with language. Perhaps they're doing this in pairs. Perhaps they're doing it by themselves. Um, and just at a very brief level, having them think about what they could wish for. Um, what would that be? What are some options that they could uh, bring into me? You could think about this yourself. This could be an oral. Maybe the students are not going to do the writing here, but they use this as a discussion that then brings them into a, um, a writing activity. You've got the visual support there, the visual cues. Uh, you can see his response to this. It's kind of, kind of befuddled, if you will. A little um, unclear, a little bit surprised, perhaps. And let's take a look at what this is. This is the first two panels of a four-panel comic. So let's see the next panel here. And um, you can see the first two panels are the ones that the, are, we just looked at, but the second panel is filled in. And let me see if I can pull the pointer over to panel number uh, panel number two. Yeah, there it is. Okay, thank you. Um, Panel number two, he says, a big sunny field to be in. <laughs> maybe not the response that students were expecting. Maybe the response, maybe what you had thought of was something different. And you can see his friend's response here, Calvin's response. He's quite surprised and maybe outraged by this stupid field. You've got that now. This is where they are. Think big, riches, power, pretend you could have anything. And then he looks down at his friend sleeping, enjoying that feel, that sunny feel. And um, this could be a very nice way for us to get into larger discussions about what makes for happiness in one's life. You know, what are our, our material things, our riches and power the most important thing, or something as simple as being in a sunny, warm field or sitting outside in the sun on a in a beautiful afternoon, is that, is that better, and why? Um, so it's not a lot of writing in there, but it gives you an opportunity for discussion, it gives you access into the language, and students um, will find this uh, interesting and fun. Um, I want to draw your attention to the website down here as well. Um, uh, so the first part of this is um, where you'd be uh, seeing, this is the actual one that we're looking at, if you could wish for anything. But there are others at this site, and you can use these. And I encourage you to Google around for Calvin and Hobbes. There's lots of images on the website uh, out there, and um, Garfield and others. And we'll look at a couple of others in a few minutes here. Um, so let's move on. We can see um, how to take out just a little bit of dialogue there and bring in um, potentially lots of language from our students. And that's what we're looking to do, isn't it? We're looking to give that little springboard into the language, that placeholder into the language for students, and then have them take that and run with it and play with it and make stuff themselves and to create language. So we're not giving them everything. We're giving them something. We're giving them a little bit to put their foot down on the ground and to then run with it and to take that opportunity, that visual support, and that access in to play with the language, to be creative, to ultimately to grow in the language. So let's take a look at another one if we can. Um, and this one brings in pragmatic intelligence. Um, pragmatics is oftentimes hard for us uh, in, to bring into classrooms. Um, pragmatics is things like humor, and, uh, appropriate responses, and politeness. Um, sarcasm can be part of pragmatics part of humor. So um, we could be looking at, um, we'll see in just a few minutes, um, another um, opportunity for you to do some writing. Um, okay, so get your pens ready. Uh, appropriate um, um, appropriate um, 
responses. Um, and not a lot of language, but some very um, meaningful language uh, that students will see as, um, as getting at um, the heart of uh, inter interpersonal communication here. A very quick little slide for that. Okay, let's take our pens out and let's take a look at the next slide where we're going to do a little typing or a little writing. And so, um, just like we did with the first um, um, uh, Garfield slide. Okay, let's go. Um, and um, we see here he's um, he's um, saying to his spider friend, "Hello." And uh, the spider responds, uh, "How's it going?" And he responds, "Not bad." Right? And so we then see him take up the, the newspaper that he's holding below here, and smack again with the onomatopoeia, the onomatopoeic language. And he says, "Yourself," which is what you would do in the target language, right? This is reduced speech. This is what folks in native speakers would, would say. They might not say the entire sentence. Uh, and how, are, how about you? Or you might just say yourself. And then the spider's response coming from this little bubble here. And we could have students do that. And we could get at appropriate responses, politeness, sarcasm with this. What might you say under this? And so we might say, um, I've been better. I'm looking at some of the, uh, we could say things like, um, um, uh, I'm okay. We could say, uh, I'm flat out. We could say, um, not bad. How about you? Um, and, um, yeah. So there are possibilities for all sorts of, fun use of language in that last box. Um, and um, having students play around with possible responses that go in there. Um, I've had better days, somebody said. Um, and um, having students um, discuss what would be an appropriate response to this little bubble here. And let's take a look at what it looks like. Okay. I've been better. Yeah, so what are we getting at here in this, um, you know, very nice, uh, again, contractions. Um, we're looking at um, uh, the perfect tense here, I have been. And um, the students would, would be able to see in appropriate responses, um, how's it going, not bad, and I've been better. Um, so. Just a little bit of language is not even like 10 words in this entire slide here, at the most, right? And so you can see that um, students are um, using this, you could be acting this out, and then coming up with appropriate responses that they themselves uh, are seeing for that, um, that box. And um, we could use this as a way of also discussing humor in the classroom. Why might that previous slide, what we just looked at, be funny? What makes this funny? Uh, is it something like uh, unexpected response or outcome of behavior? Um, this is, um, again, getting at higher level thinking skills. And so we're analyzing, we're evaluating possible responses. We're analyzing why he would have done what he did. Um, you could use this as an opportunity to discuss what students might do if they saw a spider, why he would be doing what he did to this spider. Um, Good. Let's take a look at um, another one. This one is similar to um, the um, activity we engaged with, with Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes a few minutes ago. Um, with, and it gets at sequencing and prediction, uh, higher level skills as well, uh, prediction and sequencing. So we are using language to understand the sequence of something. Um, we could give students comic with the uh, panel missing at the end or the panel missing in the beginning and having them use this as an opportunity to discuss um, appropriate responses um, and also what might be the, uh, the way that students could um, finish up something. Let's take a look at this. This is also an American comic um, strip, quite well known. Um, and this is um, 
um, it's called Peanuts. Um, it's been around for a long time. Perhaps you've seen this yourself. Um, and um, we have two characters here, again, in color. Um, um, this is uh, on the left here, and the far left. Uh, her name is Lucy, and this is her brother, uh, Linus. is watching TV here, big brown box. Here's the TV. And uh, she comes in, and she says, um, have you been using my crayons? And he turns around and says, why, yes. I borrowed them yesterday to draw some pictures. And she produces the crayons, and she says, well, what happened to the blue one? The blue one is gone. And his response is left blank here. His response with a smile on his face to her. Okay, now we could ask students to fill this in. What would might be a creative um, possibility for students to, um, to draw um, with blue? What are they going to be saying to that? What might be an appropriate or funny or uh, interesting response out of that? Um, someone says, I painted the sky. Um, someone said, I drew a big blue elephant. Um, and someone said, I've concentrated on seas. Yes, and so this is an opportunity for us to talk about what might be blue out in the world. Um, someone said, um, uh, you could have them, have them say something like, uh, I feel depressed. And in, the, in English, an idiomatic expression is when you're blue, you're, you're depressed, you're down, you're not feeling happy. So I'm blue today. Uh, that might be very creative, high-level um, idiomatic speech coming out of students with that box there. Um, and um, you could use this as a springboard. If students have siblings and maybe their own interactions with their siblings. Um, what it's like to have a younger sibling or an older sibling dealing with you know, sharing items with them. And um, so let's see what he says. He says, I drew a lot of skies. Very nice. Very nice. And so that's and then you can see that her, her reaction to this is not particularly happy. She's not satisfied with that response. This is not giving her what she wants. Um, and if you wanted to make this um, higher, more difficult, challenging to students, you could do something like this next and have her response to him. Now, this wasn't drawn this way, right? This was drawn, this was the end of it. But that's no reason why you can't have her give him another response. What might she say to him? What might be some possibilities? Um, what might be um, some other things that she could say back to him? Um, draw left sky. Mm -hmm. The sky isn't always blue. That could be black, be gray. Uh, the sky could be, you know, put in some clouds. <laughs> um, so um, she, um, you know, she could be responding all sorts of different things to him, which would give you an opportunity to bring in sequencing to, to this with students and prediction. Right? You could ask students to um, think about what she might say and then give them the opportunity to say it or to write it. Again, not a lot of language. Um, not a tremendous amount of vocabulary in here, but an opportunity for students to be creative and to give them access and a fun uh, way into the language, giving them an opportunity to play around with language. And I want to draw your attention once again to the website that I took this from. And there are plenty of peanuts. Uh, this is peanuts.com. Um, so, um, there are plenty of peanut comics on this website for you to choose. This has been drawn and printed in the United States um, for probably in the neighborhood of about 50 years now. So this is, this is a long time um, comic um, that's quite well known. It um, would be known by most Americans, if not. I mean, it would be a very unusual American who would not have heard of this strip. Um, and you could use this as an opportunity to get at American uh, culture and these kids. What are their what are their lives like? And they follow this these kids and um, these two and uh, their group of friends. And there's no adults that I can think of. There's maybe six or seven other friends that they interact with. So if you're working with kids at this age level, this might be um, a good way to bring in um, English-speaking kids into the classroom. 
that they can interact with, that they can have fun with. You could follow this daily on this website or through uh, many U.S. newspapers. Okay. So, um, target language culture. We are looking for ways, of course, to bring in the target language culture into our classrooms. Um, target language culture is easier to bring into our classrooms today uh, in foreign language situations than it was say, 25 years ago, obviously before the internet, but still challenging um, um, to get appropriate materials for us to, um, to uh, look at culturally contextualized issues. And we'll look at a couple of different ways to do that in the next couple of slides. Uh, editorial cartoons could be a nice way to do that for higher level students um, and perhaps not even for higher level students. I think it's a creative classroom so where you could bring this in for students of all different levels. Um, so let's look at a slide for this as well. Uh, this slide is going to um, be another fill in the blank, if you will. And uh, let's take a look at that. I'm just going to pull it up next. And so, target language culture, um, we're looking at a one-panel comic strip here, um, and um, this um, man, this man who is signified as an American because of his USA t-shirt uh, that he's sitting there, and he's sleeping, right? So his eyes are closed, his mouth is open, he's sleeping. We have that cue of, you know, the sleeping uh, symbol. And um, he's sitting in front of a television where the World Cup is playing. So this is from last summer. Um, so this would be um, current events for a few weeks past. And um, he's, but appropriate, even though it's the World Cup is passed, it's an appropriate, um, it's doesn't make it any less true what the, what the comic was talking about. The World Cup is on the TV in front of him. He's disinterested. He's uninterested in what's going on. And there's an arrow down to this one saying, not a football player, not a football, and not a football goal that he's making there. Um, not a lot of language again, but lots of things going on here. And I can imagine that you have students in your classroom that might be interested in... Um, in football in their country or what we call soccer in the United States. And so in the United States we would call this a soccer ball and a soccer player. And uh, we have another word for, for another team sport that's football. And that's played with a ball that looks a lot like what's on his chair here. So we can understand that he's a football fan, right? So he's an American football fan, not a football fan as in what is called in, say, Brazil or something. So, um, what might this box be saying here? Right? What is this box here? So we have the repetition of the phrase, not a football player, not a football, not a football goal. What might your students put into this box here? What might this tell them about the United States or about Americans or about American sports fans, American sports um, um, television? Um, and uh, what might the, uh, the box say? Not a, not interested. Uh, not uh, not uh, not not a fan. Yes. So let's look at what this box is going to say, and we could talk about this. Not a soccer fan. Yeah. So that's what he calls it. This is what this man is calling it. Not soccer. Right. So. What does that mean about the United States? Why have we in this country, as opposed to many other countries in the world, um, evolved where we're not interested in this game as much as others are? And uh, what that means, and how sports are sometimes culturally specific to um, the, the country and to the place. Um, and a way for us to get at that in our classroom with a um, current event uh, slide like this. And I'll show you where we got this, where I got this from in a few minutes. Um, the website is down there, but there are plenty of others out there like this that get at, um, get at uh, current events um, and the culture of the country uh, within that. Okay. Um, let's look at a few other slides here about uh, what we could do to, as we um, pull towards the end of our talk, uh, the last little bit of it. Um, we um, are um, 
interested in having students um, draw and write their own comics. Um, um, we could have students uh, do these in pairs. This does not have to be done individually. Um, we could have students, um, and I hope that many of you had an opportunity to look at some of the websites um, that um, um, were on the Ning. And in particular, the uh, Make Believe Comics site um, was somewhere that we could see students doing this. And this is a, an autobiographical comic could be drawn, if you will, uh, but not necessarily drawn, but you know, created from that website. And they could write in their own dialogue within these. And um, uh, a prompt for this might be a childhood memory, um, a simple childhood memory uh, that might engage with students and just have a few different events in there, a few different actors, uh, as a way for students to draw and to um, think about uh, an event. Perhaps you have read a, uh, a story or um, an article in class. And Thing like True Stories in the News, which some of you might be familiar with that series, we might have the students draw that comic, draw that out. Um, and we might have students using that writing activity, that sorry, that reading activity, like uh, reading a short story or reading a, uh, um, a brief news article, uh, and then take that and draw it. Uh, to draw the events of that story. News articles work very nicely for this. I've done this with students, uh, and it works beautifully. Uh, you could have students read something about um, that happened in the, in the newspaper, and then have them visually represent that um, on paper, and then discuss it, that they could actually do the writing of the event underneath as their captions. So this could be done in two, um, twosomes and illustrator writer pairs um, and it could also be an opportunity for students to connect to their own events and their own lives so an opportunity for students to draw and now that we have sites like make believe comics others are like that out there they don't actually have to do the drawing themselves which might be the most in inhibiting and um, anxiety producing part of it for them and so i encourage you to think about comics as a springboard for um, um, getting at visual representations of knowledge. So that knowledge is not just written, but it can be visually represented and having students um, be actors in that event, or actors in producing that. Um, students could then retell their comics to each other. They could use this as an opportunity to either um, present it to the class or um, with or without the visual. They might act this out. Um, they could use it as a way for them to um, predict, as we looked at before. Um, uh, I love the idea of comics, and I've done this myself in classrooms, of having students um, act out um, what they've drawn. This is dynamic, it's interesting, it's compelling for students, uh, it gets them out of their seats. And it gives them an opportunity to be outside of their own head, to be um, to get that dis that disconnection, if you will, from themselves, from the eye, to someone else, and then using that drama piece. And so you're interacting and you're getting students connected with reading and writing and creating and then acting that out, and using all of that as a springboard for um, for um, for creating. For, for using higher level um, cognitive and linguistic loads. Um, so I encourage you to think about comics as a uh, great way to get at acting because there, there's actors already in it and they could be acting out any one of those scripts that we already saw, um, having students play Lucy and Linus and um, 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 get at um, using language themselves. Maybe they're creating their own script for Lucy and Linus. Um, so, when we teach in classrooms, we want to make sure that, of course, we've got the four skills going on, and um, we are, you know, using comics as a way for us to um, get at reading and writing and listening and speaking. So, uh, we have small chunks of language uh, with uh, comics, and the comics are a way for us to get at, um, at, um, at language on a small scale and small chunks of it where they can have access into it. 
And we saw that already. We could increase the dialogue. We could increase the load, the linguistic load, and the, uh, by having them write their own. So that gets into the writing piece of that. They could finish their own comics or, or comics that, they, that you gave them. So there are opportunities for students to do short writing, which we saw with, with the Lucy and Linus. We could have them do um, the reading, obviously, is, is inherent within comics in many cases. Um, you could have them um, read this out loud to each other and listen to each other. So you have the listening and speaking part of that coming into that. You could have them acting it out. You could have them discussing and explaining in their small groups why one character behaved in a certain way, why they would behave differently if they were this character, what this tells us about that character. So there are plenty of speaking prompts that we could be um, getting at with our, um, our comics and the listening that comes in that in inherently. So all of these are integrated within that. If you think back to the Lucy and Linus, um, the reading there, the speaking, if you're acting that out, the prediction, so you have the writing skills there. It's not a lot of language that you're giving them, but there's the possibility for them to create lots of different language themselves. Language that has multiple forms of correction because maybe there's different responses and different ways of looking at the issue. And this gives that negotiation piece going on. So you've given them just four or five panels, maybe not even 10 words of language, and you're giving them an opportunity to spring forward and to create in a fun and meaningful, interesting, dynamic way with each other. This is clearly a group or pair work activity. It could be done individually and then you could have an opportunity for comparison back and forth, but it really lends itself nicely to that group work and that visual support that comes in there with it. So, um, print literacy. I think the comics give us a nice opportunity to promote print literacy with students. Um, and so, um, in places where students um, are um, not reading from left to right, well, this promotes that. Um, so in English, we're reading from left to right. And so this gives us an opportunity to foreground that, to look at um, um, thought bubbles versus dialogue bubbles, what that means. And so when we looked at um, um, most of these, they were, they were straight lines off the, uh, off the speakers. And um, the, um, the, the uh, bubble uh, would be a different thing. It would be a thought bubble as opposed to a uh, speaking bubble. As I said earlier, we saw examples of onomatopoeia. So these are words that sound like um, the, uh, the sound that, that the word makes. And um, so with gurgle and goggle and um, uh, sipping and things like that with Garfield with his coffee. These were uh, onomatopoeia and the students could, could have a lot of fun with acting those out and making those noises themselves and comparing them to what they themselves might um, um, make those noises. Um, gives us lots of opportunities for, um, 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 for punctuation marks, um, for looking at punctuation within a, uh, a comic. So exclamation points, questions, periods, uh, dashes, all of these are going to be embedded in, in comics and if we're teaching punctuation, these are ways for us to get at that. Um, it makes us understand as well when we're looking at uh, underlining or bold facing or different kinds of fonts within comics, what these um, might signify. So um, let's keep all of that in mind as we use comics. And these are not just what's being said on the printed page, but the, the, the cues that are coming at you from looking at those images. Um, assessment, we all need to assess in our classrooms and assessment is, um, assessment is um, something that we should be doing um, on a regular basis. And we, are, we know that assessment is tied in with instruction, uh, that it's not just we teach for several weeks or several days and then we test, we should be testing as we're teaching, that they're integrated, that they're at one with each other, that assessment is something that is constant, it's a feedback loop. And so the students are doing things and you, if you've got rubrics, you are assessing students continuously. You're using small classroom activities as assessment activities as well. 
and we can see opportunities for that with comics and so oral assessments students are speaking about the comics they are um, maybe acting them out and you are trying to form your interested in contractions or reduced speech and their use of these and you've got a rubric that that promotes that um, that that gives you an assessment tool right there um, you might use them as an opportunity for dictation there's not a lot of uh, words involved with some of these comics and dictations are a terrific listening um, 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 activity a listening um, test um, um, it's an opportunity to incorporate listening and writing, um, so students are, um, are isolating those skills. Um, if you're looking to isolate skills uh, and to test the student's oral ability, you can give them a comic without any words or any writing and ask them to uh, tell you what the action is. Or you could ask them to you could isolate that into uh, to a speaking test. You could also isolate that into a writing test. Um, you could have students uh, look at that and then write the dialogue that they think uh, should go there and use it as a very quick, easy assessment measure. That close activity um, that we looked at earlier could be made into the one with Garfield, could be made into a, to a written assessment. Um, so you're teaching reading, you're, you're doing a reading writing assessment with that. Um, so um, these are focused, easy assessments to bring into your classroom and to get students active and to get quick, very fast information about their abilities. Perhaps you've been teaching adjectives and you give them a comic with three or four adjectives blanked out and they have to produce those adjectives and they do or they do not. And that gives you information about their abilities and how well you might have or may or may not have taught something. So uh, assessment is there in it. Um, let's talk about some of the, um, as we wrap up here, we want to make sure that we understand that comics are adaptable for, um, for um, lots of different levels and abilities. Uh, there's not just, what we looked at primarily today, um, we've looked at um, primarily uh, comics, um, single panel and multiple panel comics, cartoons. But there are uh, ways of extending that comic books. Uh, I would not say no to comic books in your classroom. Terrific way of bringing in um, um, uh, language that is non-threatening and interesting to students that they will perhaps be familiar with the, the genre. And so they will see this as something that they know about and that they will enjoy. For maybe older students and for students that um, um, maybe comic books may not be appropriate, graphic novels. These are a big, big thing um, uh, in the United States today and uh, many countries in the world. Um, graphic novels uh, are really uh, having their moment, if you will. And if you um, are familiar with graphic novels, are, are anybody, um, uh, there's a poll question that we could ask about this. Uh, how many of you have read uh, a graphic novel? It's a poll. And I use the word red in the sense that, uh, okay. Okay, so not, it's like more than two thirds of us at this point. Okay, so it looks like a little bit over two thirds on, on towards 70%. Uh, folks have not read graphic novels. I would encourage you, and I'll put into the Ning um, some uh, links of uh, graphic novels. Um, if you went into a, a site like Amazon um, uh, or you just into Google and typed in graphic novels, you would get lots of different hits and you would see uh, what they are. And what they are is essentially what that sounds like. It's a novel that's um, graphically um, portrayed. There's going to be dialogue and pictures, um, and it's a way to get at um, um, literacy and uh, storytelling um, um, with um, strong visual um, support. Um, cartoons, wordless books, um, even further along the spectrum, um, wordless books, what exactly what it sounds like, books that are just pictures, uh, and students could provide the words themselves. Um, wordless books are also having their moment. Um, so you would be adding both the dialogue and the text as well into these things. So it doesn't just have to be Peanuts or Garfield. It could be something like a graphic novel, and there are lots of them out there, and I encourage you to think about that possibility. Um, and um, so, and I would think you could also, if you had access to the internet, 
follow a daily comic strip in class. Many of these are produced daily in the United States in newspapers. Um, and we'll look at a couple of other possibilities. Um, some newspapers have uh, weekly comic strips, a couple of weekly comic strips. The New York Times has a um, weekly comic strip on Sunday called The Strip that's uh, often based on U.S. current events. Uh, I'll link to that on the name as well. That's um, pretty high level, but it certainly is um, U.S. popular, I'm sorry, U.S. Um, current event culture, and um, you might find that interesting as well. It's a nicely drawn color strip. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the advantages and then quickly the disadvantages, and then we'll look at some, um, some, um, some slides about things we could um, use in our own classroom. I'm mean, sorry, um, websites. Advantages. Uh, I hope that we are um, clear that this could be fun. It's interesting and it's motivating for students. It's got all of those pieces within it. Um, it's inherently fun. It could be interesting and um, students are going to be motivated by it. Um, it's got multiple opportunities to incorporate the target language uh, and culture and you're able to work in um, pragmatic intelligence as well there uh, with politeness and, and humor. Um, it can be and it should be student directed and student centered and um, real world and authentic language. So you've got you know, the, 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 it's not disembodied, it's not, you know, uh, it's not inauthentic, it's, it's, it's the language that we're using and it's current and students will find that motivating onto itself so that we are using language that is being used out in the world today. And I think students will, will appreciate that. Um, it should promote uh, four skills, creativity, um, negotiation uh, of meaning and communication among students, uh, independence of thought, so that students have different kinds of opinions and different ways of looking at a topic, and they can, um, they can um, um, use their own opinions to explain why they think something happened or why it didn't happen. So all of that uh, L2 that comes in through the back door that is not explicitly what you're teaching, but they have to use it to complete the task, that's terrific. And if you can find ways of getting that into your classroom, all the better, and this gives you that possibility. Um, and as we looked at before, the higher level thinking skills that come into play here, um, the analysis, the synthesis, the creativity piece, all of these are going to um, be inherent within comics. So let's um, talk about some drawbacks, because there are obviously a drawbacks. Drawbacks uh, with everything. This is um, it's not a perfect. Um, it's not perfect, and there are things that people might might um, have issue with with using comics in the classroom. Um, and I think the most obvious, uh, the most one that you might deal with most is that it's not perceived as serious or real, or or uh, what students should be looking at in the classroom. That it's, it's non-traditional, if you will. It's, um, it's uh, outside, perhaps slightly outside the mainstream, uh, depending on your situation that you're in. So you have to be aware of that and um, um, understand that before you use comics in your classroom, if you have folks that might perceive this differently than you. Uh, and the way to uh, address that is to believe in it yourself, I believe. I think that that's at least part of it, to believe in it, to understand the value of it, to understand that you are the expert, you're the teacher, you're the language teacher, so you know why you need to be using this, why this is good to be bringing into your classroom, what are the benefits of this. And you have you know, 25 slides behind it that, that explain some of the benefits and some of the reasons why we want to bring this into our classroom. And so being armed with that knowledge allows you to uh, feel comfortable with using something that might be slightly non-traditional. But it requires that buy-in from you to believe in it um, and to be able to explain it to um, folks who may not believe in it um, as much as you. Um, so good. Let's take a look towards the end here uh, at some resources. Okay. Um, um, there are... Um, three different websites that I'm going to give you, um, and um, we'll look at these in, in order. The first one has already been on the Ning, and I hope you have an opportunity to check this site out. This is a uh, site, Make Police Comics, with an X. Um, it's been on the web, it's been up since uh, 2009, 2010. Uh, I've used this for the now, last couple of years, and classrooms with teachers and um, I know that many of my teachers have used it with their students and I hope that you have an opportunity to use this. It's a terrific site, really 
powerful, um, um, compelling site that gives you lots of information that you could be using. The Association of American Editorial Cartoonists has a website um, that gives you editorial cartoons. Um, and I've also pulled up the New Yorker Caption Contest. New Yorker is a magazine here in the United States that uh, runs a caption contest every week, and we'll look at that next. Okay. So Make Believe Comics. Um, do check this site out. This is a great site, great, great site. Um, free and available to you and to your students. Um, many of you, I've noticed, um, not many of you, some of you on the, on the name of last time I looked this morning, had created your own. How nice is that? Um, so um, it's a way for you to make your own comic. And the next slide gives you a sense of what it looks like. Okay, so I created this one. Um, but you can create your own. And so you've got characters that you can choose from. Um, let's see if I can pull the pointer up to this. Uh, okay, thank you. Let's see if I can work on. You've got characters that you can choose from. And, uh, yeah, good. Um, so there might be something in the neighborhood of 20 or 25 different characters to choose from on this website. And these are, I've chosen one, two, three, four, five of them here. Um, but there are a whole bunch of others that you can choose. And then they also move around. And so um, he has different expressions that you could, uh, depending on what he was saying. And as I wrote in this box, and I wrote this, uh, Make New Comics is a terrific site. It looks, um, it's loaded with great free, and this, I really want to emphasize this word here, this uh, word free, resources for the classroom, words that you can just, you can just take this, print this, this is not copyrighted, protected, this is just there for you to use. And so, and I, I guess the money is being made off the ads on the website, so take advantage of that. Um, it's got dozens of characters, um, yeah, at least 20, 25 different characters. Um, it's lots of fun, that three letter word there. And you can do things like put in little background colors, and I put in the rain here, and here's a thought bubble versus a, uh, dialogue, a dialogue bubble. Um, you can color, you can use lots of fun features. And this is true. Students do enjoy this. Students like this. Uh, this is just a lot of fun in the classroom, and you can imagine this as autobiographical um, possibilities. So if you went back to this website, this you can create, you can click here and how to do it. Uh, I encourage you to play around with this website. There's a, uh, a link down at the bottom that says for teachers. Uh, I can't pull it up here, but at the bottom it says for teachers. Click on that. Lots and lots of resources and opportunities to create and teaching you how to use it in the classroom. So you don't have to just be on your own with it. People have done it before you and they've uh, written up really nice um, ways of using this site in your classroom. Um, and Bill Zimmerman's article is one of the ones I linked to, so by all means take a look at his article. Um, American Editorial Cartoonists, they have um, a uh, website with a caption contest, and this is what their front page of their website looks like. And you can submit captions for the cartoon, so like the one we saw with the football soccer fan. You could be submitting those and students could win a prize. So I encourage you, these are full of current event slides uh, that are going on, uh, activities that are going on now in the world, and so um, editorial cartoonist site. site. The New Yorker Magazine every month, uh, sorry, every week, uh, it's a weekly magazine, runs a caption contest, and so they give um, a blank comic without any caption, and you can ask students to write a caption for this cartoon right here. And they would look at this, they would look at the visual cues, and they're sitting here in a restaurant, and they've got menus. And then the next week, they could uh, look at the, this is what they'll do, it's a three-week sequential thing. The first week, you'd get the blank, and you could do this in class. And then the next week in class, you might look at the possibilities for the captions. These were submitted by uh, folks in the United States to the New Yorker magazine. And you could have students vote on these. Um, um, you could have students read these three. First one says that science says home cooking. The next one says it's not a menu, it's a first aid guide for burns. And the last one says, it says here um, that service is not included. And you could have students vote on which one of these is the best caption for this comic and why. Terrific, not hard to do. Bring this into your classroom. This is not copyright protected. You could have a lot of fun with this in the classroom. And then the next week, you could tune back into the magazine and see which one of these three won. 
Uh, so this is actually what's going on right now. The winner is not yet been announced. You can go to their website and find out the, um, the winner, if you will, and why that one won, not the other one won. So that could be a really terrific classroom discussion going on there. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, other resources, I've given you a couple of slides of uh, literature. Uh, to look at. Um, and there's lots written out there, not just the article that I've given you uh, from Forum, which is very nice, got lots of good classroom activities in it, but uh, other ones as well. Um, and going way back to, you know, the mid-1970s, uh, a, an early article in um, uh, on using comics in the classroom, an oldie but a goodie. This is not out of date. This has got lots of good stuff in it. Um, and going on from there, um, so I encourage you to check out some of this literature if you want. Um, it's, most of this is available through databases. This one is a TESOL quarterly article. And I encourage you to think about this is people have done research on using these in uh, the classroom. Great. Thank you so much um, for coming out uh, today for this. And uh, hopefully this was good uh, for you. I hope that you have an opportunity to, um, to um, sit around and uh, stay and talk with your friends uh, about this and what you've learned. I hope this was a, a meaningful and uh, interesting um, uh, event for you and that you got some ideas out of this. And I look forward to interacting with you on the name uh, over the next week or so. Thanks again. Bye now.